White Christmas. This is a film that I had never seen until last night. Wow. And amazing. It is amazing that I have never seen it. And I think one of the, the lifelong issues I've struggled with is my lack of knowledge of very key movies and even very key genres. Um, I've just been recently diving into Westerns. Um, I watched the John Ford, John Wayne Cavalry trilogy uh, a couple weeks ago. And now I'm really getting into musicals. Uh, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. Like the first, the opening five minute what? scene <laughs> in, great. in World War II, <laughs> This opening scene, like in Vista Vision, uh, this crazy song and dance number with the comedy and also the weirdly uh, tense drama. I was I was in love. I'm like, this yeah. is what movies, this is movie yeah. magic right here. Well, you know, it, it has such a long history for me. It's really difficult to put in perspective. You know, what I did is I rewatched it this morning with the Rosemary Clooney uh, um, di dialogue that they do on DVDs. The audio commentary. A, uh, audio track. Yeah. Audio commentary. Thank you. I couldn't think of that term for some reason. And, uh, and I was just, I was in heaven. I was like, I was sitting there. I said, this is what Christmas is all about. <laughs> Rosie Clooney talking about white Christmas. <laughs> she was, was cracking me up. She, she had a great time doing the commentary. Now that's that's George Clooney's mother, is that right? No, it's his aunt. His, his aunt. His, his father's sister. That I'm Nick I'm Clooney's relieved. Sister. I'm relieved to find that out because the resemblance, the family resemblance, is so striking. But it's also so striking George's resemblance to his father that I was like, his parents looked like they could have been related. Turns out that they are related, but they're not parents or they're not husband and My wife. So and yes, huge relief. Um, but I was kind of distracted throughout the entire movie because she's great, but I kept seeing like a really young, like facts of life era George Clooney in drag. Uh <laughs> I never even thought of that. That's funny. Um, I um I first first encountered this film uh when I was about 18, where I knew it was a cohesive film, you know, bits and pieces over the years. Uh you know, forever. But what happened was my high school basketball coach used to have a uh, Christmas party every year at his house, which was weird enough because, you know, going into your teacher's homes, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But for some reason, this movie was on and everybody in the room ended up watching it. And that was the first time I saw it. So, and then, then the other story of course is in 1994 where a couple of my friends had just gotten divorced. I had never been to the sing-along before. So we got a group of like four people. In those days, you could buy your ticket at the box office, sit wherever you like, because it was maybe three quarters full. But, uh, oh my God, that was it. I was there every year, ever since. You're talking about the, the music box sing-along, right? <laughs> yeah. Huh? That's yes. the music box, right? Yeah, so you have to experience that now. You, If, if you love the movie, You'll love it a hundred times more after you see it at the music box with a crowd and fingers crossed that'll happen next year. So uh, I, I, my, I watched they did, it. They did the drive-in this year. I, I wondered about that. I, you know, it's nice to be able to see it on a big screen, but you know, I, I turned to my wife cause we watched it together and she'd never seen it either. Um, I said, oh, the wow. next, yeah, I said the next time this plays in a theater near us. And again, hopefully it's the music box uh, we're going because this is, this is the definition yeah. of a movie palace experience. I'm not, I don't think I've ever really been What's to this? a sing along, but I'll go for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not. It's not as goofy as you think. They they bring out they bring out some professionals, and then Santa comes out, and then uh, Dennis Scott, who is the traditional organist there, they do like a sing along, and it, the words are up on the screen. You can sing. You don't have to sing, and uh, it's just it's just one of those things that puts you in the spirit. I mean, I, there's nothing else to say, but you're going to be in the holiday spirit. I have converted practically an army of like the beginning of the film an army of people to going to this thing because they've had such magical experiences with it and uh you know i i have to say in the in the latter years i would say in the last five years i i'm a, it comes so quickly again that it really and and since i'm doing the movie review thing 
it's really, it's more difficult for me to sit there and go, okay, <laughs> bring the spirit. But ultimately I get into it. And uh, there's so much, so much uh, to say about the uh, tenor of the film. It was directed by Michael Curtis, who is probably one of the most prolific studio era guys. He directed Casablanca for God's sake. And they also directed um, White Christmas. It's just, it's crazy. We, and then of course, Bing Crosby, Mr. Christmas. Well, hold on a second. I, I forgot to look this up before we started talking and it's embarrassing because yep. I feel like we've talked about a Michael Curtiz film in our, it was like something that was a, an oddball choice because I remember us referencing, oh, this is the guy who did Casablanca. What else right. did we talk about with him? I don't know, man. <laughs> okay. Not, you're asking me to bring up the memory <laughs> banks. I'm terrible. I'll tell you what. You you vamp for a minute. I'm gonna go. Well. I'm gonna go that here. Blow and, in the uh, head didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So uh, yes, everybody. <laughs> Pat has a a shiner <laughs> from a from a a, a well fought battle with some Chicago concrete. <laughs> He's okay, fortunately. That's right. Um, yeah. Fell, seeing, fell oh, on to some concrete. Completely okay. It looks waste. Then it is. I know what it was that we talked about. It I'm was. Bringing, I'm bringing up White Christmas, though. It was uh, Elvis Presley's King Creole, which we talked about a few years ago. Of course. Yes. Of course. <laughs> cray, cray. Another <laughs> another great <laughs> music movie. Now, yeah, Bing Crosby. I think this is the first uh, again. I, so much, so many holes to fill in with my my filmography, my filmic filmic knowledge i think this is the first time i've seen a bing crosby film all the way through and the first time i've seen a danny k film wow. all the way through um and oh yeah well that's a little easier you know that's did, a little easier to believe i guess he didn't do a whole lot i i don't know i don't know much about danny k the only danny k <laughs> reference i had at this point was clark griswold's rant in christmas vacation <laughs> oh I thought you were going to say that Danny Kay dated Lawrence Olivier. That's another big rumor in Hollywood. I missed that one, but uh, all right. <laughs> um, no, I think... I've gotten pretty deep into this film, so I, I, I can pretty much answer anything about it. But uh, Well, I think we should so just... I try to find new things. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, let's do, do, do the plot. Okay. A plot summary, a quick one. All right. This is uh, a movie sort of about show business, which automatically I'm kind of a sucker for these, these stories, you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, Crosby and Kay play these two soldiers in World War II. Their, their group is being, uh, they're on the front lines. They're being sent into battle imminently. There's sort of a changing of the guard uh, as their old uh commander is you know stepping down the new guy is being driven in a jeep up it kind of ex escorted but uh what was it i i should get this the name right what's the name of the old guy who's retiring is it wallace or something oh, general waverly waverly yes waverly. Uh, waverly tells the guy driving we the jeep love to love him yes we love him <laughs> That's the other thing. I love every song in this movie. There's not a dud in the entire batch, which I can't believe I'm saying. Um, but no, so Waverly tells the guy driving the Jeep to take the new guy up this winding path that's going to kind of lead him astray while he goes and says kind of goodbye to his men who are putting on this sort of a an unsanctioned show on the front lines. Uh, there's an emotional moment the where he's saying lines. goodbye. Then all of a sudden the they're being bombed. Huh? Oh yeah, it's it's totally a backlot. I, I mean, said in the studio, they recreated this all on a soundstage. And for you know, for the time, I think it's uh, it, they did really well. Whatever kind of hokiness you might think watching this through the 2020 lens of like, oh, it's very clearly a set. I think you make up for it in the emotion of that. You know, the guy kind of looking over all the people that he's led and getting emotional about it. There's then there's all of a sudden they're being bombed, and the sort of the catalyst for the story. <laughs> is Danny Kay saves Bing Crosby's life. He keeps a wall from falling on him. In the process, his, his arm gets horribly injured. Uh, fast forward to the whole speech of like, well, if there's anything I can ever do for you because Bing Crosby's character is a big time entertainer. Danny Kay has always wanted to be that kind of on that level. So when they get back to the States after the war, they team up. 
and they go from a one man show to a, a sensational duo that's traveling all over the place, making tons of money and, and fame and accolades and all that. Right. Uh, they remember Ian, you'd have to pay. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. What am I missing? I said, remember you have to, you'd have to pay six sixty or eight eighty to see Phil Wallace, Wallace and Davis or Bob Wallace. Sorry. I missed that. Did you get that line? No, that, that's it's hilarious. He goes, you'd have to pay 660 or 880 to see a cal- uh, an entertainer of the caliber of Bob Wallace. Here's the thing. <laughs> I just watched this movie. I, I watched this movie last night, like 26 hours ago. One of the problems, the only right. problem that I have is not a problem at all. It's that I need to watch this movie again, probably another two or three times just to absorb the dialogue because this has that classic movie musical comedy rat-a-tat-tat dialogue on top of the fact they've got so much physical comedy particularly between crosby and Kay, in a scene where they're just in their dressing room getting ready for the next bit they're tossing clothes to each other they're changing costumes they're like putting you know closing (laughs) cabinets and stuff it's amazing i mean i I just, it's one of those situations where at the end of it, I was like, what happened to movies? Why can't they all just be like this? I would watch White Christmas twice in the time it takes me to watch Tenet and not feel like I'd been cheated at all out of, you know, four hours. The, um, in that particular scene, um, the scene where they're ta- having dialogue and tossing clothes to each other, Bing strips to his tidy whities And when you're in the music box, that's a highlight scene. Because everybody is, woo, baby. <laughs> I And I understand why, finally. Bing Crosby and Danny Kay are hot. I don't care what Kay was doing with Olivier, uh, allegedly. I'm, I'm sitting there having like this bromance crush on these two entertainers through the screen. Are, and I've been great. I've been married for a decade and a half. Uh, but I got to <laughs> say, <laughs> I got to say, so the, the rest the, of the plot. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, uh What's funny is, and, and I, I just wanted to mention it because it came to mind, there's nothing really said about the fact that, that Bing is in his, uh, clearly in his 50s. I, you know, Danny Kay may be pushing a little south of 40, mm-hmm. and they're going after women who are clearly in their early 30s. If that, I've said none of these people got married <laughs> and came well, together. Well, they, they didn't get married on screen, but, you know, uh, White Christmas 2, the honeymoon, um, holiday honeymoon, yeah. that's it. Uh, no, so, but you bring up the uh, the younger girls. They're the Haynes sisters, um, Judy and Betty, played by uh, Rosemary Clooney and Vera Ellen, who has a, it's a hyphenated name. Vera I don't, Ellen. Did, did, was that her yes. first name or her last name or her first and last name hyphenated? What, what was the deal I, with her? I believe it was just a stage name. I, I, I don't know exactly uh, her, her origin as far as her real name, but I think it was just a stage name. She was interesting because she came in on the latter part of the um, musical era of the studios, MGM, Paramount in this case, but they all stopped doing musicals flat in the mid fifties. And she was at her peak, obviously. And she had a precipitous decline after that all went away and pretty much died fairly young. I don't think she got to age 50. Oh my God. But she's clearly anorexic in this movie too. You know, and that's <laughs> honestly, that's something that if I do have a, it's an odd criticism to have because it involves an actress in her body, but my wife picked up on yeah. it too. At a certain point during, I can't remember oh, what yeah. dance number it was. She was in the classic, I, I don't know what you know, the name for clothes, but it's almost like a bikini bottom, you know, the kind of the showgirl thing where you can very clearly see the yeah, legs yeah. and almost everything else. Uh, right. The the skinniest legs I've seen on a performer yeah. in I don't know how long, and we both kind of looked at each other like, "Can you take your eyes off her legs?" Because I can't. And she was like, "No, it's it's distracting." <laughs> um, but skinny, as a, skinny, but all muscle. It's it, I, yeah. it dancers' legs. She, there was not one wasted, but she had some sort of. I, I haven't delved into it, but I know p- other people have mentioned it. So. Her real name is Vera Ellen Westmeyer Rowe. So she got rid of Westmeyer and Rowe and put a hyphen in there and you got yourself a showbiz name. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's, it's for anyone who, out there who's going to rag on me for criticizing her legs, I will say 
that I think she gives a great performance and a yeah, physical performance oh, and also as like a romantic comedy uh, kind of lead. So the, uh, you know, our two heroes, Bob and Phil, Bob Wallace and Phil Davis, uh, they kind of hook up with these. <laughs> Wallace these, and Davis. Yes, Wallace and Davis. They kind of hook up with these, uh, these sisters. They follow them to Vermont and end up staying at an inn where the sisters are supposed to perform. The guy is like, yeah, we'll just kind of tag along for the ride. Turns out the inn is being run by uh, their old sergeant who was, uh, sorry, Major General Thomas General. Waverly. Yes, De uh, Dean Jagger, <laughs> who <clears throat> if I kept, every time I listened to his voice, <clears throat> and occasionally picked up on some of his mannerisms, I thought if they were to have remade this movie five years ago, Robert Forster <laughs> would have been perfect for that role. <clears throat> He's just got this, there's not yeah, very many very people good. I've seen have the Forrester thing, but this guy totally had her. Maybe Forrester had the Jagger thing. Uh, but, you know, he's the kind of the gruff old guy who loved his troops and now that he's retired, he just doesn't have anything to do except run this kind of a failing in. And the, the, the quartet, as it sort of formed now, get this idea to put on a show, bring a lot of business into the inn so they don't have to close down. There's some shenanigans regarding, you know, a threes company <laughs> style misunderstanding about like, is this going to be a paid gig or is it going to be free? That kind of drives the rest of the plot home. We don't really need to get into that because it's pretty yeah. simple. Yeah, but I think, I mean, I, I would say most people listening to this have seen this movie, but that's a pretty good summary of what's going on. Uh, yeah. There's so many little things little touches in this that really put it over the top for me. Uh, a lot of trivia. Uh, I'll, I'll name one of the most famous points of trivia is that Carl Alfalfa Schweitzer plays the photo of the, of the dog face Haynes boy, uh, freckle face Haynes. And he's also in It's a Wonderful Life. So he's done a couple of classic films where he's just a small, small part, but and he was once alfalfa in the our gang comedies. So, a, a great piece of trivia there. I always wondered about how and, he felt. Uh, about... Mary Wicks. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I think the MVP in this movie is Mary Wicks, who plays uh, Emma, the uh, busybody uh, innkeeper. Um, clerk or whatever or secretary or uh, sorry secretary what a term uh, executive assistant of the inn or the manager she runs everything and she's a busybody so she helps to drive a lot of the shenanigans but how about the bit where where she goes up to him when they give the idea that you're going to save the inn she kisses danny k full on the mouth and danny k said well he thought of it pointing to bing Kisses him full on the mouth, and Bing goes, wow, and comes back in for another one. <laughs> that associated with an earlier bit, but one of the classic scenes. Mary Wicks is just amazing in this film. She is. I've, just I've, amazing. I've, she ended up uh, years later in Sister Act, if you recall. She was that, the old nun yes. in Sister Act. You know, I knew I had recognized her from somewhere, and I may have seen her in something else besides Sister Act, because she has one of those familiar faces yeah, if you've seen her in something you know or you know you've seen her in other things i i can guarantee she probably had over 100 roles i'm just going to click real quick but you know it's it's a uh, you know she's just she was just everywhere in the movies and and uh she was in um uh the dinner oh, shoot now i can't think of the name of it who cares but yeah i'm looking at her filmography and it just goes on for years yeah, uh, I think she made her debut in a pretty famous film, "The Man Who Came to Dinner." It's another oh. considered a Christmas film, and she plays a nurse in it. And that was 1942, but she actually started out in shorts. So, "The Man Who Came to Dinner" was her first uh, full film. Not bad, a classic. And her last film was in 19. Uh, well, she was in a TV show, "Life with Louis." What was that one? Life with was, Louis. Was that Louis Anderson? Was that? I think it was. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was a. Uh, it was a cartoon. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, so she, she was the voice of Grandma in that. So 1997, <laughs> her career ended. I, I assume in her death, but she had 144 credits over that time. Wow. Yeah, and so, she she is a great part of know, the uh, it, the cast. Yeah. 
um, Rosemary Clooney in the commentary said what she was she had a lifelong association with Bing Crosby was with him on his last tour when he died in 1977. So I mean, just literally from cradle to grave, she was with Bing Crosby. Of course, younger her her cradle his grave. But anyway, um, he said she said that as soon as he died. About he, she goes five years go by and it's like he nobody ever heard of it. So she referenced the guy whose biography I read at Bing, and she said he's been working on this for seven years. And he told her that what he uncovers about Bing Crosby is the history of show business, basically. So, but today, you know, thank God they're, they're that White Christmas exists, or Bing Crosby would not exist in the uh, media circus that we have today. So, well, I think, huh? you know, it just, it, it does, it feels like it is sort of being memory hold along with a lot of, you know, old cinema. I mean, you get people, and this is not to disparage any particular generation, but you've got folks who won't watch stuff that's more than 20 years old. Um, you know, forget about black and white or, you know, things that were made in the fifties right. in color. Uh, you know, it, it's crazy though. I don't know if you watched uh, Saturday Night Live last night. Did you happen to catch that? Hello. Did you well, see? They did, a, they did a White Christmas take off. They did a White terrible. Christmas. Well, yeah. I mean, it was it was an awful bit, but my my soul lit up just the just the kismet. Uh, I can't imagine. You know, because we had finished watching White Christmas a half hour <laughs> before SNL. And then to see this White Christmas sketch, inspired sketch, I'm like, what is going on here? This is crazy. Well, I was I was kind of disappointed because I said to Robin, "Oh, here comes a White Christmas takeoff! I can't wait!" And it it just served for Kristen Wiig to do her tired old bit yeah. of whatever she was doing. That show was terrible last night. They could not they could not rally for her. I don't know if she it's maybe she said she wouldn't do any of her old characters because I of course after the news I'm out I'm done I was asleep yeah I didn't. But, uh, well, she, I, did, I didn't see any sketch that was worth watching. Yeah, I mean, she did do um, the the all, the failed Broadway star kind of a bit on the 1963 oh, game show. That. That's one of my least favorite. Yeah, I, I laughed a couple of times yeah. during that. I can't remember what the jokes were, but that's, you know, the ephemeral nature of SNL. Uh, but yeah, it's just <laughs> it, it was just an aside because talking about this yeah. being culturally relevant and, you know, forgotten, it was nice to see it even if it's not explicitly referenced as being white Christmas, it's clearly the white Christmas setup down to the set. Yep. Yep. I knew I was, yep. I knew I was in good yep. hands with this movie during the opening shot where they show the kind of the Christmas painting or the, the Christmas backdrop. And you think, Oh, this is just a matte painting that's going to bring us into the film. And all of a sudden you've got Crosby and Kate dancing across it. You and you realize, it right. It's the, it's the, the setting for their Christmas show in the middle of this war zone. Cause you keep pulling back and you Nicely realize done. Yeah. It's, it's, it sets the entire tone for this cheeky, emotional, fun song and dance movie. And I got to say the dance numbers, I was watching this with sort of a, critics eye i guess not so much the comedy in the story because that was just all top notch but the dance numbers i noticed there are very few cuts so the scene where i can't remember the song it was but it was with uh, vera ellen and danny k they're at this dinner party and they kind of dance out onto this uh, back balcony and there's like they're dancing yeah. right next to water there's only like a handful of cuts in that entire song and you realize they're really working it they're dancing up on top of an upside down like canoe and then back down <laughs> yeah. there's no marks it's like well, rosemary nuts. clooney in the go ahead yeah rosemary clooney in the commentary said they rehearsed that a thousand times because he just wanted to keep the camera static he didn't want to have to do a lot of cuts in that he just wanted a, a, a big big time overview michael curtis so they were actually at novello's nightclub where the Brooklyn Beauty, or bombshell, excuse me, the poster is backstage. I think I found a new niche for you. You find these little pieces, set pieces in old movies, you recreate them and you sell them to people who want a piece of White Christmas because we've commented on that poster for 20 years. 
And finally, I said, <laughs> oh, my God, I have a way to get this poster recreated. <laughs> so well, I, I can't I can't sell it. I can if I were to do it as a Christmas I project, I just give it to you. Yeah, I can give it to you as a picture, well, but I can't sell it because I mean, it's, uh, it's your issues. It's your, no, it isn't. It's 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 a piece of ephemeral in the movie. Speaking of ephemeral, it's, mm. it's a piece of. Ephemeral. And I, and I don't think I don't think there would be a copyright issue on the Brooklyn bombshell. We, we'll have to talk about that offline because there definitely would be, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but I no. swear to God, no, no. I I swear to God, anyway. yes. Coming from my my anyway. my former experience I'm with licensing, to... yes. What I'm referring to just quickly is there is a poster backstage of Novello's uh, nightclub in Florida, the beginning of the film, and it's the Brooklyn bombshell. It's a, a girl with a one-piece bathing suit kind of whipping off her top or something. Not, she's not nude. And uh, it just it's fascinated me for the years I've seen the movie. And finally, I was able to pause it and take a picture of it. So I, I'm very happy about that. That made my morning. <laughs> I, I can tell that was uh that was that was quite That's a delightful it, yeah, I mean, message yeah. it did. <laughs> um but no i mean there's that we're talking about the the songs the yes i've always had a problem with musicals in that it is just kind of weird for me to watch a story and then all of a sudden people break out into song this movie does a nice <laughs> mixture where there are song and dance numbers that are the acts that the people in the movie are putting on right but then they also do the whole spontaneous right. we're sitting by a fireplace and all of a sudden right. bing crosby starts sitting the songs you know by irving berlin are just so catchy oh, and fun irving berlin yeah, I'm like, okay, now I understand the Irving Berlin thing because usually when I watch a musical, I can sit there and say, okay, seven out of these 10 songs are good. One of them is great. The other two are completely forgettable. Most of the songs in this movie were, I think, really strong and more than a few of them were great. Uh, I'm thinking of well, choreography, know, I, which is mostly a dance number, but it's so, so much fun. Yeah. Um, the one thing I will say, I used to constantly make fun of the what do you do with the general song, but I'm listening to Rosemary Clooney's, um, you know, commentary, and she said, this is the perfect example of Irving, Irving Berlin. He could make a lyric and a song about something as far-fetched as generals being no longer necessary because the war is over. And, uh, you know, that's another, another big thing is that um, this is a real post-war, it's almost cultural when you think about it, because the, the notion that we have in the 1950s that was after World War II, the middle class had a huge boost, everybody had jobs, prosperity for all, and, um, this movie kind of reflected that optimism, you know, because everything was kind of joyful. The guys getting together to honor the general towards the end, all the veterans, you know, coming back together after they've won the war, they're all getting in their uniforms again to say hi to the general. I mean, how can you not feel a sense of America was a different place? Yeah. You know. Well, it's it's interesting because I mentioned the Calvary trilogy, um, uh, sorry, Cavalry trilogy uh, with John Wayne and John Ford. Oh, there you go. Um, I sorry mentioned, about that. No, no worries. I mentioned the uh, the Cavalry trilogy with uh, Wayne and Ford. Did you ever see yeah. she wore a yellow ribbon? It's been years. I've okay. seen it, but it's been. 20 30 years yeah well it's, it's i went through all that stuff go ahead no i was, I was gonna say it's uh 1949 i think it won best uh the you know, best picture best cinematography that year um but it is it's a few years before this movie but they share this idea of the retiring uh general or sergeant kind of getting wistful oh. in front of the men uh and i think this was a nice kind of successor and an expansion on that idea you get that in the opening scene, but then you really get that played out beautifully, I think, in the end. Because it's one thing to see a guy on the field of battle saying, well, this is my last bit. I'm going home. I hate to have to leave you guys out here to fight the rest of this war, but you know, I got my orders. To 
him being in a very different place in his life. I think that, I think it's like 10 years, five or 10 years later that the, the main story picks up and he's just completely lost because war is the only thing he's ever known. And he wonders if anybody remembers or cares about him because he's in a failing inn in Vermont. Right. That last set piece, I don't quite know what Vista Vision is or what it represents, but I'm, tr I'm struggling to think of another it's movie. The that I, screen. Well, it's not, it, it, I don't doubt that that's what you're saying. And I don't know if it's just because this is the first time I've really been conscious of it, but there's something more than just a widescreen presentation. These frames are so stuffed and so colorful with information sets people that it almost seems like a yeah. trick of the eye. Like I shouldn't, I, I feel like I'm watching a panoramic view of a stadium in almost every shot, even though it's just a static film screen. When everybody comes marching out and lining up to meet the general at the in that last scene, I, I honestly didn't know how I was seeing such a depth of field. It looked like I was seeing something that went on for miles and it was just magical and, and very touching too. Well, that's funny that you mentioned that because over the years, you know, when I first saw this film at the Music Box in 94, we were kind of subject to those scratchy prints that they still had around. There was, wasn't the, the restoration craze hasn't, hadn't really gotten off the ground in 94. But now you go and see it and it's pristine and it's, uh, the sound is incredible. And you're just like absorbed into this colorful, as you said, overstuffed world of this division. <laughs> and inevitably, when the it's sort of like Rocky Horror Picture Show when you see it at the music box, which is another great aspect of it. And I'll give you a few of the cues, but uh, inevitably, and one of my friends started this years ago, uh, once that InvistaVision comes up, some, inevitably somebody will do announcer voice, InvistaVision. <laughs> I, you know, and I, again, I hope to be there someday in the music box or another theater to hear that, to hear that announcer and maybe even be that announcer voice now that you put it in my head. Exactly. <laughs> if you're in the, if you're in the music box, you can do whatever you like. I'll only give you one more just not to spoil anything, but this happened a few years ago and it was absolutely hilarious. Somebody go, uh, one of the lines in the movie is, is from Betty. She goes, uh, Betty Rosemary Clooney, she goes, why don't people mind their own business, okay? I think it's when they're at the nightclub scene right before her, or Bing and her are talking and somebody screamed from the audience, yeah, why? <laughs> like that. <laughs> and everybody just started busting a gut because it's just one of those things. How about her number, love you didn't do right by me with the four boys? That was, that was a bit wild yeah i i got a like a very marilyn monroe vibe really? off of Crazy. that yeah um you know cray 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 <laughs> yeah very very monroe i think that's what they were going for interestingly enough but it it, it, it it harkened back to the days of the chorus boy but this is sort of a chorus boy meets martha graham which are making fun of by the way in the song choreography and hmm. guess who is one of those four people sir oh george to who, George Chakiris, who would win an Oscar uh, for West Side Story uh, five years, well, 10 years later, or, you know, excuse me, eight years later. Okay. Yeah, he was, he played uh, the head of Sharks and uh, he still lives and I interviewed him. Wow. Did you talk about White yeah. Christmas or West Side Story mostly? Oh my God, yes. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> we even posed, we even posed in the, in the same pose that, <laughs> I'll send you the picture. It's amazing. <laughs> who was the who who was the rosemary in that situation? Was it you? <laughs> Did you get uh, yes, because he was playing him. Okay. So I, just, I was rosemary. I didn't know if you exactly. I didn't know if you switched roles or something like that. Um no. But here George, by the way, is, is very out and proud. So cool. Um he became a silversmith. <laughs> like making, like making uh, yeah. silver crafting? Wow, that's, a, yeah, that's quite yeah. a uh, change from show know, business. Literally moved to, to Arizona. And he's, he'd, he'd been in the business probably 
I don't know. He retired maybe in the eighties. I think he worked as a choreographer, et cetera, et cetera. Hell of a dancer. Oh, I yeah. mean, he's one of the best. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, West Side Story is legendary. So. Yeah, I did. I but, got you know, to see that. Uh, I, I saw that at the music in, box in during that, their 70 millimeter fest a few years ago. So based on his close up in that scene with Love You Don't Do Right By Me, he got 10,000 letters. And, they, and Rose, Rosemary Clooney said they would address him, the boy next to Rosemary Clooney in White Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what launched his career. <laughs> wow. You know, one thing I want to... There's I, so much great stuff in this movie. There is. And, and one thing I wanted to call out um, before we have to go is earlier on, it's the scene yeah. where um, Wallace and Davis meet the Haynes sisters. Uh, the Haynes sisters kind of end up skipping out on uh, skipping out of town uh, to avoid some legal trouble. Uh, and in order to facilitate their escape, the guys pose as them and sing their number. And uh, the first the, the song that we see them perform in the club, the sisters initially, it's called Sisters. Ten minutes after they perform that, you've got Crosby and Kay performing the same song. Of course, they're kind of done up and they're right. they're pretending to be, you know, women, <laughs> but they sing the whole song again. And I think under lesser circumstances, I might just be sitting there rolling my eyes going like, I just listened to this song. But the entire presentation, <laughs> the context is so different yeah. that they're both takes on it are so enjoyable and memorable that you get it twice within 10, you know, twice in 10 minutes. And... um uh, again, Clooney pointed this out, but I already knew this. The take that they used with D, uh, Bing and Danny was where Bing was cracking up all the time because they play. He, she goes, they played both and they, they did it perfectly. And then there's not enough comedy in it. But with Bing cracking up constantly, it was it was it was perfect comedy. So, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, uh, do you do you, do you recall the line mutual? I'm sure. The, the there's a chorus girl that keeps whenever she meets anybody, she says mutual. I'm sure. Her name. Um, I want to get it right here. Let me get the cast list out. Uh, Barry um, Barry Chase, in, and she's named Doris Lenz in the movie, but uh, she is a crowd favorite. The music box mutual. I'm sure. Well, I'm, you know, you I'm sure. Imagine. I mean, pe people literally clap when she comes on screen. <laughs> well, I, I love, I think it's her final scene is where they're doing the, uh, the couples are doing the dance and they're trying to get uh, Clooney and Crosby back together again because they've been squabbling. So they keep switching partners yeah. on the dance floor. And there's this random guy yeah. who cuts in with Clooney, but then he gets turned around to this other, this chorus girl. And she's, you know, mutual, mutual, I'm sure. She's very young and attractive and bubbly. And the guy seems kind of like, well, hey, this isn't so bad. A minute later, after the scene is winding down, you see them, the camera kind of passes by them and he just looks miserable. <laughs> like, oh, this is not what I signed up for. <laughs> <laughs> oh. it's the small touches and when you see it 30 times like i have you know all the small you know the brooklyn bombshell poster <laughs> well so here's something that i had not expected is it's called white crimps christmas a lot of it takes place mm -hmm. it takes place during the winter and at the end there's of course the white christmas number where you know they're all in santa hats and christmas trees but this is one of those right. not really a Christmas movie, Christmas movies, because the kind of the, the joke at the setup is they go to Vermont expecting all the ski and the snow and it's going to be a winter wonderland. They get there and they're in the middle of a heat wave. It's like 70 degrees and they don't know if there's going to be snow on Christmas. So and it's not a particularly holiday film. They're not getting ready for the big Christmas show. They're just Until getting the ready end. for a show that's going to right. benefit the inn. So it's just a fascinating idea that they could have really called it anything. They see, just seem to name it after this big musical number. Well, White Christmas has its origins in the 40s when Bing put out a recording of it. And it, it was like one of the first multi-million selling discs. I mean, he, they both him and Berlin cleaned up on it. I didn't know that. He introduced it in the movie. 
uh, called Holiday Inn, which they used to show a lot at Christmas, but it turned Holiday Inn just quickly is about they do little musical numbers about each of the holidays and start at Christmas and, and then back at Christmas. So, of course, it's a Christmas movie. During the Lincoln Day celebration, everybody's in blackface. <laughs> and that was the movie that White Christmas was introduced in. Well, and, uh, and honestly, so there, there, they there's have this property White Christmas. They decided to make a movie around it. And uh, that's the genius of the film. It basically starts with the song and the fact that the song came out during World War II. So let's try to get a reunion of the World War II people uh, and, and bring this song out to light again. Genius. That is great. Because again, I didn't do any research on the, the film, obviously. So I just assumed it was a contemporary, like I'm maybe the movie. <laughs> that, that, that's right. You're the, uh, you're the Patapedia. Um, but uh, I like right. I just assumed that the movie came out and then the song kind of was a huge hit after that, but this predates the film. Now, one thing that you brought up that uh, I got a little tense during a particular song, uh, a number called Minstrel Show, where I was like, yes. oh no, they're not gonna, and they didn't, fortunately. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a, it's a catchy number. Well, you know, and that no, go That's ahead. one of Bing's weird quirks in his career. One of Bing Crosby's weird, weird, weird quirks is that he came from the vaudeville era and seemed to have no problem with blackface whatsoever, even though I think the, uh, the, the mores were changing even during his time in the 40s and 50s. Now, there's a film where he plays um, Stephen Foster, who, who did Swanee River that cannot be shown again because there's so many blackface numbers. Mm. So it, it's just so odd quirk about Bing Crosby that he's been in a number of films where they've done blackface. And the minstrel number sort of harkens, but it, does, it doesn't, you know, you can call it minstrel can be any, you know, overall term, but it does harken to possible blackface well and that's that's well <laughs> why you, did we talk about this then the show i don't know well but it's 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 just a very odd note because yeah they are all in yeah. like black suits with like red gloves and shirts and there just seemed like there was yeah. one detail away from this being uh, again an, another movie that you kind of have to put into the vault and, <laughs> and not speak of again um but uh well, I, I always tell people if they need to go to the bathroom during the music box show, go during the minstrel number because it goes on for a long time. And while it has some very weird elements like Vera Ellen's dancing and, and, and a lot of other things going on, you're like, you know, if I miss this, I'm not missing the thread of the story. Right. <laughs> so that's the one I recommend. Yeah. The rest of them stay. Yes. And, you know, I even like the song. So, uh, and but, one more. You know, yeah, go ahead. One more piece of trivia. The song Snow, which is a very big highlight in the film for everybody. Every, everybody sings along with the music box. Snow was what is called one of those in the trunk songs. Berlin had had it for another show. And, he, and the original title was Free, R-F-E-E. -E. So it was free, you know. So uh, took it out of the trunk, dusted it off, put snow at the title and rewrote it. And it <laughs> goes on as a legendary song. I, I love these stories. Now, I, I know. Now here's a question, because you talked about earlier about uh, Bing Crosby, his, you know, a book about him. Is that being written, did you say, or it's out? No, no, it's written. Uh, okay. Pocket Full of Dreams is the first volume. I'm not sure what the second volume is called. I've read the first one. I haven't read the second one. The second one should be more fascinating because it's his second part of his life. But the first one, oh my God, the, what the guy, again, him and Jimmy Stewart got in the show business because they were in their college follies group and th then just like got the bug. And then they just happened to be in the perfect timing uh, Stewart was 10 years after Bing, but Bing started in Broadway, worked his way up the spectrum. He literally is one of those performers that was in every medium up to this point. 
I, 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 he hasn't had a YouTube show yet, so he missed that because <laughs> he died in 77 on the golf course of a heart attack. Oh, so, well, he, he, but didn't, anyway, he didn't miss anything. He's just one of those guys that did all, all the stuff in the 20th century and, um, and just started as a college cut-up, same as Jimmy Stewart, and, and became big stars because that's where they got the bug. Well, I, if nothing else, and White Christmas has given me a lot, but I, I definitely want to learn more about Mr. Crosby. So I'm going to be looking up those books. But I know yes. we're, we're kind of... Uh, I, would, I, would, I would definitely get those books. Cool. Well, I know time is sort of running short yes. for, for both of us here. So I'm going to yeah, thank you immensely could, for recommending this. talk about this for five hours. <laughs> yes, and I, I'm so happy I was able to, uh, uh, you know, extrapolate more on this. I really... I probably have a book in me about this, but we'll see down the line. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it just, um, it's just one of those classic Hollywood pieces of, of, of joy that are out there for anybody to experience. So if you want a good Christmas Eve film, White Christmas is the one you want to go for. All right. Well, this is our Christmas Day episode. So uh, thank you. Oh, Christmas this has Day been a works too. yes. Well, this is <laughs> this has been a treat, a present, a gift for me. So thank you very much, Pat. Merry Christmas, yeah. and uh, yeah, we'll Merry talk Christmas soon. To you too. And in this t very difficult year, just keep uh, going after the things that are survival instincts. What makes you happy will get you through the day. Excellent note to end on. So thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll talk about something cool in the new year. All right. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye, baby.